Welcome to episode four of Starting a Startup, where I use Nux 3.0 to create the world's best real estate investment application ever known to man. In this episode, I'll be refactoring my application and take out some chunks of code and place it into components. And in doing so, we'll create a text box, a text area, a radio box, and a checkbox. After that, we'll talk about the database schema that's gonna power everything and go ahead and create the database itself. And lastly, we'll start to set up the steps that's going to allow us to build our user authentication process so we can actually have users to sign on to the application. That's actually quite a lot to do, so let's go ahead and jump right in. To avoid having to write up the markup for this field name, email, and password, I'm just gonna convert these into components. So I will go ahead and create a new component file here. I'll prefix every component name with an S at the beginning. And then I'll copy over this starting template for a component and paste it here. And now it's just a matter of kind of um, modifying it to my requirements. I need to go ahead and get the actual markup for this field as is right now. So I will go to the sign up page. And then I'll look for the section for the field name and then I'll just kind of copy that HTML there and I'm basically extracting it and placing it in a component so it can be reused and so once I have that I can then replace that section with the actual new component that I'm creating now so it's as text box and there we have it I want this component to be able to work exactly like a normal HTML tag. So I need to be able to pass in a slot so that it replaces whatever is in that slot with whatever I pass to the components. So in this case, if I pass our new label, it will then show up there because I've created a slot to take that place. All right, so with that done, we can now take care of the process of removing the name the email and password fields and replacing it with the counterparts for the components we just created. And I'll also come back and create a props field that's going to allow us to differentiate a text field versus a password field. The one thing we don't have, however, is a way to catch updates of what's being typed into the password or name field. But to solve this problem, we'll be using composables. A composable is a function that exports a functionality and in this case, it's going to be the functionality that's going to allow us to pass properties into a component while also receive events notifying us that the property has now been changed. And so therefore, we can go ahead and update our respective local variables that watches for name changes, password changes, and so on. With this composable created, it's important to note that Composables are auto imported, so to use it, you just simply use it within your setup function. But before we do that, let's just go ahead and create our property that's going to be passed into this text box, and it's going to be called model view. And then we'll use and have access to this model view within our D variable that then we're going to be vmodeling. And every time it updates, we'll send an event up to the parent notifying us that it's been changed. And we can see that working here pretty well. While I'm at it, I might as well create several other components. So go ahead and create a checkbox. And then I'll follow that up with creating a radio box as well. They're going to be pretty much the same as the text box, just kind of with a different UI, of course, being a radio and a checkbox instead of using a text box instead so i'll go ahead and create that and just kind of test out at least a checkbox to make sure it's working as i expect and if i go ahead and vmodel that i see that as i check that it's changing state accordingly and then the text box is still working of course i created a default and a named slot and that's showing up as main title and subtitle there. And so that works. So lastly, I'll go ahead and finally create that radio box. And it's going to be pretty much a copy of the text box just with radio now. As a bonus for myself, I went ahead and close up this section by creating a text area component. 
In the last episode, I created an API at API slash server info, and it was able to fetch information from a database and spit it out here. In this video, I'm gonna go ahead and update that database code so that it's a little bit more abstracted so i can use it on a recurring basis so i'll go ahead and copy this code here and i'll move it back over to the database connection file and basically paste it back here and then rename it query and it'll essentially represent an abstraction for any type of query i want to make to the database so to do this, I will need a parameter called SQL statement and as well as the prepared values that we're going to inject into the SQL command. And so this should get us to where we need to go. And I'll go ahead and export it as an overall object that can then be referenced within our, you know, whatever file imports it. So we'll just go ahead and call it database. And now I can go ahead and do something like DB query whatever the SQL statement happens to be and pass it whatever values it needs to be replaced by any question marks that are there. I'm going to restart my server and then we'll talk about the database schema that's going to power everything. So the database will have a total of 12 tables which are highly interrelated and essentially this is what's going to store all our information about the user, the real estate properties that someone is wanting to analyze and so to go ahead and get this created, we'll create a function called initialize database. And the first thing we'll do is check to see if the database that we are creating already exists. And if it already exists, we'll just go ahead and exit the function and not create something that already exists. The way this is going to work is that whenever my server starts up, it calls this function and in so doing checks to see if the database already exists. And if it doesn't, it'll then create the database and the set of tables associated with the database. So if it does not exist, therefore the length is zero, it'll exit. But if we're past this section here, it means that we need to go ahead and create database and its database tables. So I'll start writing a massive SQL statement that's going to be responsible for creating the database and as well as creating the individual tables that comprise the database. Because I care about your time and appreciate your watching, I'm gonna go ahead and speed up this entire section here as I go through the manual process of creating all 12 of the database tables. I will say, if you are enjoying this video, it really helps support the channel by hitting the like button. Also, think about subscribing. Here I am creating the options table. The options table is going to be a table that can be accessed only by the administrative user and it's gonna hold core settings information for the website itself. After that, we have the actions table. Actions table is going to list the types of actions that can be performed on the website and it's gonna be cross-referenced against the capabilities table as a one-to-many relationship so we can say for a given role can that role perform any particular action and if there is an association between the two then it means that the user can or the role can perform that particular action next we create the user and then the user roles followed by the user meta information the data table the access table, the meta table, the tags table, and last but not least, the data tags table. And again, here is the name for the database itself. And what we're going to do is restart the server. And we should see an update when we reload this page. It will then be populated on this list. So restarting the server. I can then come back to the website, reload this page, and we should see pocket invest test. 
And from here, we can go ahead and look at the designing. All 12 of our tables are there. And inspecting the design tab, we can see all our wonderful pocket investor data schema. Nice. Next, what I want to do is update my plugin script to ensure that I paved the way for the user authentication process. Essentially, plugins are ran upon the very first visit to the website. So what I want to do then is ensure that within that script, I check to see if there's any existing authentication cookies that are there. And if there is, I'll then use it for every request I send back to the server to indicate the current user that's logged in. All that's left now is to learn more about Nux3's use of cookies. Um, the good news is that it's fairly straightforward, although I won't be using it in this particular um, episode, but essentially you just use uh, use cookies and then provide a name and a value to it and use it within your components or plugins or your setup function and you're good to go. All right, so with having learned that, let's talk about middlewares. Middlewares are really important because it allows for a way to run a piece of logic or a check before you land on a particular page. So this is gonna come in very handy because we want the user to be authenticated first before they go to the dashboard or to the application itself to be able to access certain pages. So we're gonna need essentially middlewares to be able to prevent users from accessing a resource that they're not allowed to. So for my current use case, I'll be using the global version for creating a middleware. Essentially, this is going to be running on every single page the user visits. It tells me what page they were on prior to what page they are on currently. This will be used to add in any layer of logic that needs to run before a page is rendered. So I'll make sure to add .global to the end. And basically, here's what the function looks like. So if we go over to the page and as we navigate from one page to another, it tells us that the user came from the home page then to the sign up page. And then if we click on sign in, it'll tell us that we were previously on the sign up page and now over to the sign in page. And the same thing for the home page where we were previously on the sign in page now to the home page. And finally, I'm just going to update the plugins script that just lets us know that indeed the plugin script is ran once upon the application starting and or when the user first lands on our application. And with all these things done, we see that it is displaying appropriately. This statement is only displayed once upon the initial load of the page by refreshing. But as you go from one page to another, that statement is not re-displayed, meaning that it's only ran once. This also means that the initial legwork for setting up user authentication is pretty much ready to go. And so in the next episode, I can easily focus on the user login process and building out that logic and as well as the supporting code that updates the database accordingly. All right, so I think that's a good place to stop for today. Next time we'll go ahead and actually build out the user authentication process. Before we wrap up this episode, I just want to say that in the last episode, episode three, I asked for feedback regarding application. I went online to ask other people for their feedback regarding Pocket Investor, the greatest application for real estate investors ever created. And one of my viewers gave me some real constructive feedback regarding how I should think about the application going forward. And I wanna say thank you so much, Lev, for taking the time to write out your thoughts and share with me. So here's the entirety of Lev's feedback, and there's a lot of value here for me to digest. So Lev says that the key reason why he's choosing to use an Excel spreadsheet versus using bigger pockets, valuable calculator, is because he wants two primary things. He wants the ability to add new line items as he sees fit, something that's not always capturable 
within BP's calculator. And he also wants to know about what's the formula that's been used to derive the output of the calculation. Certainly my application can do that. And here's really where I have a lot of things to think about. I get it. It may be difficult to justify paying a monthly subscription for something that you may only use for three months out of the entire year. But certainly I would hope that you know, as a real estate investor or someone who's interested in investing, you want to be constantly looking at deals the entire year, whether you're in the immediate market to buy a property or not. It might be just of interest to keep your skills fresh by continuing to look at multiple different properties. But I get it, paying for a subscription for 12 months for something that you may use for only one, two or three months may be difficult to value. But he also gave me a workable solution, which is to consider a freemium model and then charge a one-time fee of $25 to have full access to the entire application. And I wanna say again, thank you so much, Lev, for this constructive feedback. I think definitely for Pocket Investor, the greatest real estate investment calculator ever known to man. It will include both a freemium model and a paid for version. I think the freemium model will have the basic you know, calculations and reports and still have a lot of value for the end user. And of course, it's going to be heavily supported by AdSense revenue. I'm thinking a combination of videos, text, and some graphic ads. On the pay side of the application, you get a wider range of functionality from reporting to calculations. And then depending on whether I charge a one-time fee of $30 or $25, whatever the price amount happens to be, you might get a perpetual full access to the paid version with all its functionality with reduced ad supports that pays for that perpetual use of the application. Or I may have something like a $25 to $30 charge where you get to use the full functionality of the application for a period of 12 months and then after which you can renew to continue to have the full functionality for the same price of $25, $30, whatever the price happens to be. But with that said, I'm still very early in the process. So please continue to give me constructive feedback. I love them please drop a comment below and let me know your thoughts. At this point, I'm still at the very early stage and I need to continue working to get to the minimum viable product so I can get it in front of a lot of you to hopefully be my testers. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Until next time, my name is Solis Code. Check out my other videos.